today I have two of my writer friends with me, Alora and Kami, and we are going to share some Christmas recommendations, uh, which I'm super grateful for because, heads up listeners, I am not a very Christmassy person. Uh, I have very mixed feelings about the holiday season and have a long time, as some people might. So that's just to say everyone's welcome. Whether you love Christmas, not so much, all good, because we'll have some really fun recommendations. Comedy makes everything better. And I've got two lovely people to help me out and make a nice spectrum to choose from. Um, before we dive in, I thought it might be useful to say how we met, just because like, if I wind back like less than two years ago, I was literally that person on the internet Googling, how do I make writer friends? And it was really not apparent We've all been me. there. <laughs> yeah. I totally know that moment. <laughs> And I, I tried a lot of things. A lot of things didn't work, but I found these two lovely humans and way more. Uh, Alora, I actually met in a Scottish castle, which was super fancy at so a writing magical. retreat. Even saying yeah. it out loud, so magical. <laughs> It was a wonderful writing retreat organized by writers Maggie Stifata, Sarah Batista Pereira, and Anna Bright. Cami, I met online through Lena, Lainey Taylor's Patreon. Uh, I literally posted a sad little message in the Discord that was like, I'm coming to London in a few weeks. Would anyone like to meet me for a writing date? And Cami was sweet enough to reply. And we've taken it from there. So just to say there's always hope, however young, old, experienced, inexperienced you are, there are lovely writer humans out there who do want to be your friend. And I'm very lucky to have them come and celebrate Christmas in November with me here. And we'll release this show for you in December so you get some great picks. So that was a very short introduction to you both. I'd love you to let people know, starting with you, Alora, um, who you are and what you get up to. Uh, who I am? Well, I'm Alora Dannon. Um, yes. I live in uh, upstate New York, in the good old US of A. <laughs> um, I love, obviously, writing, reading. I feel like we all have that in common here. But in mm. addition, I also have an odd obsession with Elvis, um, mm. dragons. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> and um, I love writing like fun adventure stories for women, specifically over the age of 30. I feel like there's a huge gap mm. in fun stories. Mm. Like all the good things happen to like the youths and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so I love those stories, but I feel like there's room for more. Um, and it's something I'm deeply passionate about. So something writing fun stories is something Danielle, Danielle and I connected over and we're, we're going to make, we're bringing it into the world more. Like we love it. Yeah. yeah. And um, we connect over talking about dragons as well, Tamara. And actually I saw on awesome. your Instagram, Kami, as well, that you were so, yeah, I love that series. I have reread it twice this year. It's really embarrassing. Oh, it's uh, she's so a queen. Good. It's so good. Iconic. Naomi Novak. Mm. Oh, so not Christmassy, it. but extra special. We're slipping it's in an extra picky right at the beginning. So good. And the audiobook is outstanding too. If you've never listened oh. to it, it's so good. Um, Next the, year. Uh, the, uh, the, oh my gosh, the narrator does all the voices incredibly. Oh, wow. It's fantastic. Heads up. <laughs> okay, that, that's a dangerous recommendation, but I will follow it. <laughs> and I will also say quickly, if you don't also normally think of yourself as a fantasy dragon person, I still highly recommend it. The characters yeah. are so good. I cried in mm -hmm. it. I laughed in it. Oh, it was so sweet. Yeah. I think that's so, true of all of Naomi Novik's work. If you're not a fantasy yeah. at all, all she writes is really just, it's a very good introduction to the genre. I agree. And Cami, tell us about you before we share our Christmas uh, picks. I feel like Alora's uh, intro was so good, I'm going to fail at this. But um, my yeah. name is Cami. I am a French uh, person living in London, the U in UK. I, um, I basically moved around my whole life. And uh, when I settled in London five years ago, I decided this was it. I, even if at the beginning the city was really hard, I was like, I'm going to make it work. And actually, I really love it now here. Um, I have a very boring project manager day job and in uh, my free time, which is uh, most of it, I just write and read. Uh, I'm trying to um, make, uh, I'm on this journey of a writer's journey, so I now have an agent and the next step is hopefully publishing. Uh, my focus is mostly, I mean, I'm a lover of fantasy, but it's not what I started writing. Basically, the stories that come out of me are contemporary. Um, and I totally hear what you're saying, Alora, about stories past your, for women past their 30s. So I'm writing women's fiction. And it's actually about that 
uh, hinges on that age where you kind of are told like your fun years are over and you're supposed mm-hmm. to have it all figured out. But mm-hmm. actually, I I felt, at least personally, there's a lot of taboos and things that are unresolved by that point and that need to be discussed. And um, I very much think I'm taking it uh, under the guise of humor because that's how I deal with a lot of issues mm-hmm. in my life. So that's a very short summary. Um, and yeah, dragons. I love cats. Is that a okay Ooh, thing to say? I don't know. I, my <laughs> dream is yeah. My dream is to become an old cat lady, and that is pretty mm-hmm. much a short summary of me. Oh, I love it. So you can see why I'm t- friends with these two wonderful women. Absolutely, that was yeah. like a shared heartstring right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> totally. And um, actually, it leads quite nicely into my first pick. My first pick is Home for Christmas, uh, which is a TV series that was shown on Netflix. It's Norwegian. I love, love, love the Norwegian accents. They're so musical and so beautiful. And uh, it deals with a lot of the themes that you've already been talking about in that the main character, Johanna, played by the wonderful, wonderful idea, Elise Broch. Uh, She is 30 and the first episode uh, is called The Big Christmas Lie because basically her family are being super nosy, super pressuring about what's happening with her personal life. She's 30, like what's going on with her relationships. Uh, She tells a lie uh, that she has a boyfriend and then she sets out on this kind of quest to find one by the Christmas dinner. So there is that kind of ticking clock effect. But what I really like is that She is not at all painted as like this sad, desperate person who needs a person to complete them. She is fabulous. Like she is brilliant, kicking us at her job. Uh, She works in the hospital. She has a lovely relationship with her flatmate. They're really funny female pair. Um, She has like really funny friends. And um, it's more just this family pressure and this sort of mess that she gets herself into. So it might be just my take on it, but I felt it was about friendship and belonging as much as it was anything to do with the different dates Uh, there's tons of physical comedy which I really like and it is that thing where like it does have um that sort of like she is wearing really nice jumpers a lot of the time I was like she's wearing lovely Christmassy jumpers I want to look as cool as her has that nice sort of warm cozy Mm -hmm. feel but it's not super shiny uh which works for me because I don't always do well with super shiny so like there's the Christmas market but she does something very untypically feminine at the Christmas market which I won't tell you what it is if you haven't seen it um but it's very funny very comedic and like there's a sleigh ride uh but it's not like this just like oh it's all lovely sleigh ride like the person that she's with is uh, has a body that's doing what bodies do and so <laughs> it's like everything is undercut by being very human and very flawed as well mm-hmm. so last thing I'll say about it is there is like a It is very cliffhangery at the end of season one. Uh, It literally ends with her like opening the door and you wondering who it's going to be. But the good thing is uh, now season two is already out. So you don't have to wait like I did. I had to wait in torture discussing it with people being like, who was at the door? (laughs) But it's it's really fun. I really recommend it as a really great female character. Did you guess right on who was at the door? Um, it was who I wanted it to be, but not who I thought it was going to be. So I kind of guessed wrong, but I got my wish. So yeah, that was good. So that's my first recommendation. Yeah. So next we're going to uh, go to Alora for your first recommendation. Um, I'll start off with um, uh, The Spirit of Christmas, which is a uh, made for TV, like a Hallmark-esque movie. So it's... Mm. It's me- it's set up to be like, you know, this cheesy romance about this big lawyer, Kate, who lives in the big city. And she's sent to a small New England inn right before Christmas with orders that you have a big promotion on the line. And mm. if you can sell this inn within three weeks before the new year, the promotion is yours. The hiccup is, though, the inn is haunted. <laughs> and oh. um, everyone who's tried to sell it, they always run into this ghost. Um, my sisters and I have always loved this movie because it does, um, have some of those like kind of cheesy, like romance tropes, especially for like a Christmas movie, but it's also a murder mystery. Like you're trying to figure out, you know, she meets the ghost. Um, there's a lot of like tongue in cheek humor because he, um, is from like, he was, he was murdered in like the 1800s. He doesn't know who killed him, but he is, um, he comes back every Christmas to this inn where he died, but for three weeks, he has a body so he can be mm. touched, 
kissed, you know, Ooh, okay. for three weeks. And then he goes, you know, vanishes into the cosmos after that for the rest of the year. So um, he doesn't want to be creepy. So there's a lot of humor in him being like, he wants to be a gentleman, you know, like mm-hmm. he's like a gentleman ghost and he doesn't want to necessarily terrify anyone, but also get out of this inn. I don't want you to sell it. This was my home. I don't want anything to happen to it. So um, Kate's character is very you know, skeptical. She does have a wonderful career. Um, it does sort of fall into the trope of, you know, she's only a career woman and she needs to have her heart softened, which is, you know, mixed messaging, mm. but it's okay. Mm. Um, yeah. You can, you can swallow it. Um, but she very quickly gets behind, like she gets caught up in the mystery of like, well, how did you die? And there is also that, like, you know, the tragedy of like, you know, they're starting to have feelings, but he's also dead. Um, and like, do they stay in? Like who did it? Like, it's just such an unusual, like Christmas romance in that it's not overly creepy, even though there's ghosts, but there's this mystery. And then there's also all this like very sarcastic humor. Like at one point, um, the ghost is saying, you know, I'm cursed. I don't know why this happened to me, but I'm cursed. And she's like, did you meet a witch? And he's like, witches aren't real. And she's like, yeah. Okay. So that's where we draw the line at like believability. Mm-hmm. Like, of course, witches aren't real. <laughs> but like, you know, you're a ghost telling me this. Um, but it's just, it's so much fun. It has a really unexpected ending. Like it does not end at all how you're expecting it to. Um, mm-hmm. And just kind of really weaves in like somehow like even though you're solving a death like it's just funny in some way like it's just unexpected from start to finish one of my favorites that's awesome i haven't seen that have you seen that kemi i've actually not seen i mean i i know your second pick alora obviously but uh, i haven't seen any of these picks and i'm very excited to dig in yeah that sounds so fun ghosts murder mystery i love it that's a great recommendation that sounds right up my street Mm, thank you so over to you, lovely Kami. Um, so I think, I'll be honest, I panicked when we went for the Christmas team because I am not oh. a Christmas person. Like, I, oh. I, love, I love family Christmas, and that's for me what f- Christmas represents. But the holidays in general are just so loaded for many different reasons. Mm. And mm-hmm. I've never been much of a yeah, seasonal movie person or book, for that matter. But there are there's this movie, um, which is a very... It's a classic. My two picks actually are classics, but the first one um, is Love Actually, which is a British uh, comedy classic. And I think part of the reason I love it so much, it was my introduction to British humor. It's 20 years Mm. old. I was probably much younger when I, I first saw it. And it is definitely how I discovered what British humor is and can be, which is, um, you know, it's a lot of tongue in cheek. So, I mean, uh, for a lot of people who might not know what Love Actually is about, it is a British romantic comedy uh, that basically follows an ensemble cast and 12 different plot lines uh, towards uh, in preparation of Christmas. And there's tons of different plot lines. There's, you know, the wannabe rock and roll star um, and his agent. Um, there's the widower dealing with his stepchild. Um, there's um, a ridiculous romance plotline of two actors that are basically in charge of just being the light people before the actual actors come in. And they're just, that's how they meet. There's a ridiculous plotline where two characters don't speak the same language, but they still somehow fall in love. And I mean, some of it is beautiful. Some of it is tragic. There's a reference to cheating and there's reference to death and what I love about it is that it shows at least to from my impression it shows about the roundness of the human experience which can be so dark Mm -hmm. and it can be so fun and I think it's also how the movie starts it literally starts by saying by my understanding when 9-11 happened all the people on the plane called their loved ones and it's I think Mm -hmm. it just shows how no matter how difficult life can get love is all that matters and and I also love that it shows how it doesn't all it all it doesn't speak only to romantic relationships you have this crazy rock and roll star and at the end he realizes the most important relationship in his life is his agent and I I do like that that I mean it talks about obviously romantic love but it talks about other relationships and I guess I'm also a sucker for ensemble cast and stories that weave together and that are connected. 
Um, it is very tongue in cheek. I think also it's a 20 year old movie, uh, which means that some jokes haven't aged well. Uh, I was reflecting on this. Um, there's probably a bit of fat phobia in it that uh, I I want to be conscious of that. Um, but I mean, for me, it's just a brilliant story. And if there is ever a movie I want to sit down and watch for Christmas, it's going to be that one. Uh, also, the music is so good. And it <laughs> for me, that is such a big part of it. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's cheesy. It's absurd. But I love it. Um, and it is, for me, it's the optimum of British humor. Oh, yeah, you've really sold it to me because I've actually never seen it. I feel terrible saying that because it's such an iconic movie and I've seen shows that have referenced it. Like in Ted Lasso, they did a scene mm -hmm. where I was like, what are they doing? And they were like, oh, my husband's like, that's a Love Actually reference. Um, but the way you've described it, like, because I also love ensemble casts and I also, I think partly as well, like in, and that's one of the things I love about comedy and previous guests have talked about is that you get to have that like whole social group. You do I get to that. see- those different um people and things and it's not just the like the rom-com of the pair yeah i yeah i think i i i personally love when it's multiple storylines and maybe it's because i admire the ability of the writers to weave in all together and just mm -hmm. create emotion um i i just think it's a brilliant movie um and it, it's for one it's for, for me it embodies a christmas spirit because it I, again it's about it shows what Christmas can be beyond what we have as a vision. But I won't, I will say it's, it's also about, yeah, human tragedy. There's stories, there are plot lines that are very difficult. And, mm. and I think maybe that's also it. It can be dark humor. And I am someone who likes to treat dark topics with humor. And so probably that's what I love from that story as well. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And that leads right on to, um, my next pick, which is uh, this. So for people who are watching, you can see, uh, um, I can never figure out how to angle things. It <laughs> uh, was The Night Shift Before Christmas, which is Adam Kay's book. And um, some people might know him from his other book, This Is Going to Hurt, which was a bestseller. And they're all diaries from his time as a doctor. So he is now a writer full time and has been very successful uh, with his live shows and as a TV writer. But he was a working doctor for a long time. And this book, uh, It Was the Night Shift Before Christmas, is taken from his uh, the shifts that he worked over the Christmas period as a doctor. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, I am really, 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 really not good usually with medical things. I actually don't even watch most medical uh, shows on TV because I can't stand it. I've got like this Same. reflex thing. Yeah, <laughs> even a little bit of blood. Yeah. My, yeah, my ears buzz. I feel really faint. Um, and there's been different books before that I've listened to on audio. Like I've literally had to pull over to a lay by before now because I felt so faint listening wow. to like a little bit of a torture scene or things. I just mm -hmm. can't hack it. But this book, because it is so well written and the comedy is so good, his descriptions are brilliant. It's so concise. The analogies are fantastic. And there's, and it's, I would say it's very high on the humor for the dark end, but still with the heart of someone who clearly cared about uh, their patients. So actually, I was able to read it and really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I read it out loud. That's how I do quite a lot of my reading. If I'm if I'm heading to the same place as my husband, he drives and I read out loud. So I read this out loud. It's a really short little read. And at points, both of us with some of the descriptions were both just yelling because it's like, oh, no. But it's, again, that like tension release. And it wasn't um, maudling or morbid. It was just very real. Uh, and also the, like, I love how you expressed it, Kami, saying about like that full human experience, because also some of it was he was delivering babies. And it is that thing as like Christmas, <clears throat> like not all life stops. I was a Christmas baby <laughs> and uh, like humans are human. So sometimes Christmas is lovely and the turkey turns out perfectly. And other times, like <clears throat> both my mum and my dad, they were divorced, but would both tell the story from different angles of because I was born at Christmas my mum was in the hospital with me. My dad was sent to go and get all the Christmas stuff. He went to the pub to celebrate my birth, uh, celebrate quite heavily. And he left all the Christmas dinner in the taxi. So when my mum got back, there was like nothing to cook. She was mad. And it's that thing where it's like, humor is so great because looking back, I think it's quite a funny story. At the time, it might not have been. And they did get divorced. So maybe it wasn't that funny. But it's like, like Christmas isn't always perfect. And he really covers like the full 
spectrum of um, babies being born and named and it being really joyful, people being um, lonely without family, people having very serious injuries, uh, people having to work. Not everyone has Christmas off. So for like, uh, again, I don't want to bring the tone down too much, but for all of us that love like the the fact you can bring comedy to all the realness, it's a yes. really delightful book. And oh my goodness, he's just such a brilliant writer. He, yeah, hats off. One of the... Um, best sort of diary based books and some of the best descriptions in anything that I've ever read just so good stick in my head uh, absolutely nailed it and very very funny I did literally laugh out loud so that's my final recommendation over to you Laura um my other recommendation is uh, it's iconic in its own in its own right the book and um specifically the 1990 1990- four version of little women by Louisa May Alcott. Um, I was uh, homeschooled as a kid and my mom was huge into like re- us reading classics and also specifically reading books before we saw the movies. And mm-hmm. I was very, I love to read, but I was very grumpy reading like <laughs> Shakespeare <laughs> or Dickens. Like I was very grumpy. Like, why do I like, it's as, like 12 and 13 year old. Like, why can't I just read like normal books? But like, <laughs> Um, by the time we got to Little Women, I feel like it was like the first time as like a young reader, I saw myself in a book. And it's, for those who don't know Little Women, it's a semi-autobiographical um, work by Louisa May Alcott. And it follows the life of main character Joe March and the other three March sisters um, living with their mother during the American Civil War. Um, and it follows them growing up. So kind of leaving their girlhood and entering into the early stages of their womanhoods and facing adulthoods in all those different ways. So it's very much a coming of age story, very much a romance. Um, jo is a prolific writer. She loves writing very like wild stories. Um, and then her sisters act them out. It's like, oh, it's such a, it's such a good, a good book. And I, I know like probably so many writers identify with Joe as she kind of finds her voice as an author um and also you know she falls in love it's like such a sweet romance but for me like as I was watching as a younger person I couldn't get over how like funny it was like the antics of like you know the sisters they um all become friends with the rich neighborhood boy (laughs) who's in the movie played by Christian Bale young Christian Bale oh my gosh swoon Mm. um (laughs) But uh, I think the it was like my realization like that, you know, we get so, so much from like, you know, classic works of literature, but this is the first time like I saw myself in a character and also like her aspirations, like she wants to be a writer. She follows that dream all the way through. Um, as far as it connecting to Christmas, I, this comes out much more, I feel like, in the 1994 version of this movie, um, the whole beginning part of um, Little Women is set during winter. Their father's away at war. They're kind of like in genteel poverty, so they don't have much, um, this family. But um, their mother is a very, like, charitable person, like, trying to look out for other people. And it's a sense of, like, charity that she wants to impart upon her her daughters. And I'm with you. Christmas can be such, like, like it's a, it can be a difficult time no matter if you, like, I, I do love Christmas. But for me, it's always been, like, it's constantly changing. Um, I, like I come from a very big family. So like how Christmas changes as everyone gets mm-hmm. older um, can be difficult. Um, and what I loved was seeing how in this story, these girls transition to adulthood, their lives evolve, but like they all always treat like their family unit with such like, it's, a, it's such an important role in their lives, no matter where they go. And I loved seeing that in the movie, like, um, it's funny, like the banter between the sisters, like they fight, they get into fights with the, with Lori, the neighborhood boy, like, um, they fall in love, they grow up, like just all the different ver- like versions of their life. But, um, for some reason it being set in the beginning at Christmas has always cemented it in my mind as a Christmas movie. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it kind of bringing in like, you know, the, like how family dynamics work. Um, a big part of, uh, Christmas for me too, was my mom. <laughs> The day I like brave little 12 year old Alora confronted her mother being like, did you lie to me about Santa? (laughs) I like held on to that for a long time. And literally she made me feel like this big because she was just like, there is a spirit 
of Christmas that overcomes like the world? Like, what do you think makes people go out of their way to be kind or sweet or, or give presents to Ron kids questioning their parents? Like (laughs) there is this like spirit of generosity that is so prevalent in this holiday. Um, Like it can be sad, but there's also this on the, on the plus side, there's also this sweetness to it as well in certain aspects. And um, that kind of spirit of Christmas was also something that was so strong for me in the film version of Little Women. And I do love the newer version too, um, with Sir Sharon, I'm like Anything. obsessed with it, right? It's a beautiful movie. But for me, the 1994 movie came a little bit closer to like a book, the book adaptation. And because I grew up with it, I'm, I'm deeply fond of it. And it's, it's a star studded, studded cast, like Winona Ryder, Christian Bale are in it. Like it's such, um, young Claire Danes, um, young, uh, Kirsten Dunst, like there's so many people in it. Um, but like, you know, just following the dreams, Christmas spirit, family relations, like it's such, oh, it's so iconic in so many ways, but oh, it's such a place in my heart, like forever. <laughs> oh, I'm going to have to go and watch it because I've seen the newer one, the Greta Gerwig I, one, but I haven't mm-hmm. seen that version. Have you seen it, Kami? No, I uh, definitely remember the uh, uh, Greta uh, Gerwig one. Um, and it is such a good pick, Alora. I mm-hmm. Now you're making me want to go see Christian Bale, <laughs> young version. <laughs> And it is, I will say, this is, this can't be a spoiler. Little Women is like hundreds of years old, but like, you know, Joe doesn't end up with Lori, right? Like that's the huge thing. When she turns down young Christian Bale, you're like, are you sure? Are you you sure this is the right choice, Joe? It stings a little bit more. (laughs) But still, they're amazing. It's an amazing movie. Love it. Oh, thank you. Oh, and I'm just, oh, I can just see that scene so clearly. I can imagine you at 12 as well with your mum. <laughs> like stomping and they're like, what do you mean? You've been lying. And she's like, what do you mean? Talk <laughs> yourself. Like, yeah. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, that was good. That was good. <laughs> yeah. And we're on to our final pick. Oh, um... Alora, that was an amazing pick, and I want to talk Mm. more about it. My final pick um, is also a cult classic that you won't have heard of. It's a French cult classic. So Mm. I'm going to bring you back into the 80s, and you have this star-studded ensemble of actors that have uh, wrapped themselves up into a name of the the Troupe du Splendid, so the Splendid Troupe uh, theater group. And um, they have done a few comedy uh, movies and they are also doing this theater show called Le Père Noël est une ordure, uh, which translates to uh, Santa Claus is a stinker. Or actually, mm-hmm. if it, it actually translates to Santa Claus is garbage, but they did a polite <laughs> translation of it. Um, and it was a success on the theater, so they decided to make a movie out of it, which was not popular. We're in the 80s and it's quite controversial to call... Uh, Santa Claus garbage and um, even if these these are star studded casts for France it's it's just it's off the cuff cuff dark humor it is French humor at its best um, and I, I struggle with French humor because I think French humor is not politically correct and mm. uh, French humor at times can be really problematic and there's this sense in France of like snobbishness of saying oh well you should be able to joke about everything and and I mean, that's a whole other debate. But Le Père Noël est une ordure is one of these movies that for some reason became a classic in France. It shows every Christmas it's on national TV. And even if you've not seen it, you know quotes from it. That's the kind of movie it is. Um, and without going into too much detail, it's totally absurd. You need to lose your sense of rationality because I was thinking about it. Some things that the characters do in the movie make no sense but basically the plot is we are following two you know do-gooders it's the night of christmas and they are at a sos kind of helpline you would call if you're in a distress of some kind and they're clearly bored she is in love with him but he is just not noticing any sign and what follows is just 
I don't even know how to describe it. Like, there's someone who gets stuck in the eleva- elevator shaft. There's a neighbor that's like giving terrible food to everyone. There's like, there's just so many different aspects to it. Um, it does end with a murder, which is the murder of Santa Claus or someone dressed as Santa Claus. <laughs> and it, it it does end with them kind of hiding the body. I'm not gonna say more than that. It is um. It is not politically correct humor. It is, you need to put it back into the context of the 80s as well. But I think what it tries to show is the hypocrisy of like well-meaning people and confronted with the social realities that they're not equipped to deal with. Um, I don't know why it became a classic. It's just one of these things, I I guess, good cast, fun fun plot lines, uh, funny lines. Um, and if I were to pick a movie that I could watch on a yearly basis, it would be this one because it's one of the ones you forget enough of that when you re or you rediscover it every time you watch it, um, it, it's not, I would, I would not say it's an, you, you don't get attached to any characters. Like for example, Little Woman is a movie where you really are rooting for the characters. I don't think that. Uh, Santa Claus is thinker. You're rooting for anyone because they're not not none of them are really nice characters. They're just like caricatures of what uh, society has defined them to be. They've been put in boxes. But I think you're just you're just rooting for like uh, like you're just laughing. Essentially, you're just laughing at the absurdity of life. I suppose um, it's had a few reinterpretations, mostly in theater. Um, I I didn't even check if you could watch it in the US or in the UK, but it's definitely some like if I think if you want to watch French humor, this is kind of like the start of French humor um and explains why French humor has become French humor today. I love that. And I'm so excited to find it. I'm sure there's a way to track it down, even if it's a getting a DVD or who knows what, but that's so interesting to me. And um because one of the things I love best about like the time I live in in terms of entertainment is being able to watch things from around the world absolutely Mm -hmm. it's been one of the things that I love I know there's so many like we've had the writer strikes recently and there's all kinds of different things in terms of business models and what Netflix and Amazon are doing but one of the things I really love is watching shows from around the world that I haven't seen so French like call my agent um family business like yeah and all these performers that I just would never have seen like wind back you know, even five years, 10 years. And I think it's so important too, because um, we are so used to, I I didn't realize until I started watching shows from other countries, uh, especially Spanish cinema, Mm. how used I am to uh, the Hollywood-esque type of model and how quickly it closes you into the specific model of writing or storytelling um and and it's because that's the easiest tweet you can access and all of my humor is very much hollywood-esque but it's good to see other things too um spanish cinema is really good for that mm. and like what i love about your recommendation too kami is like the like it's irreverent humor it sounds like yes like, that's exactly it right it's like, irreverent. i love that <laughs> And I think I think it's a good description of French humor. French humor mm-hmm. is irreverent, and I think sometimes it takes it too far. But this movie, I mean, again, putting it its context, it's I love irreverent humor. I, exactly, that's exact. That's such a good description. Thank you, Laura. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that is good. And I um I know different people have different takes, but I I am someone that still likes to watch things in the context that they were made. And also because I, I think like particularly the people who listen to the show are writers and creators. So are really thoughtful, analytical people who understand that it was made at a certain time and, and can even find that interesting and be like, that's interesting that that's moved on. Like with comedy, like you mentioned, um, Camille, like uh, references to weight and how much like that gets used in humor as such an easy target. And it's interesting to see like where we are with that and where that still happens, where it's improved. And the same with so many stereotypes, uh, so many ways that women are depicted. So not very Christmassy, but just because I have two lovely <laughs> smart women, I couldn't help myself. <laughs> no, but I think it's such, I, I, and I want to touch base on that because mm. Little Woman, and I think I was reflecting on that. Little Woman and also Everything Written by Jane Austen um, 
are still classics to this day. I don't know that there's not an adaptation of Jane Austen or Little Women that I would not watch and cry. <laughs> Yep. I'll like <laughs> I'll watch them all and I'm like what is it about these stories that have stand because I watch Little Women I mean context of civil war it's such a different life to what I'm living um it's such a like I have I mean very little in common with these little women but also it's so relatable and I just I I, I find it amazing that there are some authors who have managed to stands the test of time and are still really relevant oh it's such a good point such a good point like what do we I have don't... in common with Regent Sierra England anymore but I will literally watch any adaptation that is Jane Austen related Little Women relate like you know what I mean like it's crazy it's a it's a testament to what they created and yeah that we're able to still it... find things that speak to us that's it's wild and do you reckon that it's the humor is my question because I, it's interesting that you talk about humor in little woman mm -hmm. or is, is it just the spirit that they've carried about like this is our humanity and let's let's make fun of it while also glorify like not make fun of it but let's let's tell like put like let's let's show it in all its full form and it can be humorous and lovable and all these things i don't know i just find that really admirable oh, that's an excellent point because i feel like humor can like comedy can humanize us all and mm. like like i said like a little 12 year old alora come into the classics so grumpily and not seeing herself in david copperfield but then opening up little women and being like what, what? like <laughs> it could be like this and like Seeing, like, I, I feel like humor gives um, a little bit more of a full scope of a person sometimes. Like, sometimes you're using it, right, to, like, totally deflect. But in some t ways, it's, like, a crutch to, like, talk about darker or more sensitive topics. Like, in some ways, it's, like, a bridge to who people are. And th the fact that you can laugh at that or smile, um, like, it, it can, it's, it's just, like, such a connection. Um I think it's an awesome, awesome point. Awesome, awesome way to think. Look at that. Uh, you brought the right pick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm very grateful for all your picks today. And I'm genuinely going to go and watch all of them because I haven't I know, seen I was them writing episodes. them down as we were talking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so lucky me. And anyone who's listening or watching, um, I hope there's something in there that you would love to uh, partake of too at this holiday season whether you're someone who loves Christmas not so much somewhere in the middle all the things um there's something for everyone there and thank you very much Alora and Camille for joining me today before we wrap up um starting with Alora where can people go if they want to come and find you in a nice friendly way to say hello and happy Christmas Alora and see what you're up to um, I love TikTok. I'm on TikTok and yeah. on Instagram. Um, but I'm a little bit more prolific on TikTok, but with my You're handle, my person. handle is Alora Dannon, just my, my name. <laughs> I mean, and uh, Alora is very modest, but Alora is a TikTok star. She is like, <laughs> I'm not on TikTok, but she is a superstar. Um, and that's so impressive. Yeah. I yeah. admire anyone who has figured out TikTok. <laughs> Mm -hmm. I don't know if I figured it out, but we're just winging it and it's going okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <Awesome. laughs> and also, um, so brilliant that, it, again, that one of the reasons I really wanted uh, Alora and Camille to come on is because they are just such like fun, honest uh, women and uh, do like whether it's social media or uh, in writing or whatever, are sharing their experiences in really fun and honest ways. And Camille, where can people come to find you? I do have a TikTok account, but I haven't posted in so long. I'm, um, I, it's a space where I, I just, I'm so impressed by the content people create, and I'm so scared of it at the same time. I think I'm just scared of things that I can't control, which is very much all social media. Um, I have the where I'm most likely to be found is on Instagram, uh, which I'll give you my handle. It's Camille. Le Baron uh, author, I think. I should know that better. Um, and that's where you're more likely to have any news from me um, and anything like that. But I'm very much someone who's still figuring out how she wants to be online. 
Yeah, and I, I mean, I love you saying that too. And it's real, like for me as well. I am not very good at all. Just like time. I'm, sometimes I'm like, time, what what time, how people do it? I don't know. <laughs> so, it's a full-time guess, job. <laughs> yeah, so we all have our little areas, I guess, that we love. And for me, this is this podcast and getting to have That's these amazing. kind of conversations and have you all to myself on a Saturday and then get to share you also with other lovely writers who are going about their writer lives. So obviously I'll put those uh, links links in the show notes too so you can find them there and to everyone who's listening or watching I wish you uh, the warmest warmest wishes at this time of year whatever you're up to and thank you so much Alora and Camille thank you